2020 really is the year where uh, the world is sort of galvanizing its commitment towards a, sort of a net zero by mid-century. Um, as I said, as a, as a confessed uh, committed greenie, um, it was with great relief that I saw Biden uh, sort of kind of stick his nose ahead and, and the blue and uh, hence the green coming out in the US, which I think is also going to be a great move for sort of the energy transition globally and for green energy. And you'll see a key uh, sort of thread through this um, sort of brief presentation is that um, the energy transition is both a threat and an opportunity for Africa. And we certainly believe that uh, we need to look at it as an opportunity and move in that direction. Taking a sort of a little bit of a step back and say, well, what is this energy transition? So uh, 2020 really is this pivotal decade where we're seeing that uh, the energy transition has, has shifted really from being a sort of uh, an academic exercise with lots of subsidies to now actually being the, uh, the cheapest form of energy globally. Um, it's disrupting traditional energy markets. Um, and, and I think when you put COVID on top of that, all that's happened is it's really accelerated. So um, the way we behave um, in terms of our demand for energy, the way we consume energy and what will happen um, in terms of energy markets going forward is, is really radically changing. Uh, the positive aspect of COVID as well, though, is that we've you know, probably seen, uh, had a window into what green and digital economies will look like. Behavior and the way we consume energy has permanently changed. And we're seeing that this is permanently moving and changing um, markets. An interesting point that we'll bring through is that there's a bit of this inflection point has also created a separation in the way developing economies versus developed economies are navigating this energy transition. So developed economies have a lot of uh, cash and they are investing behind this sort of build back better approach to their economies and they're using the energy transition and, and green energy as a way to do that. Um, for the sort of the non-believers, um, the reality is that renewable energy has now consistently made up over 50% of new global energy being built every year since 2016. Um, it is the cheapest form of energy. Um, and we have now, it's I think commonly accepted, we've seen peak oil. So we saw peak coal in probably 2015. Um, peak oil, global oil is 2019, and we will see peak gas. So the concept of a free feedstock, which is the, the sort of the basis of renewable energy, in compared to those historic energy models where you've got to go and dig fossil fuels out of the ground and process them, clean them before you can sort of convert them into energy, is really fundamentally shifting the way the models work around energy and the way the value chains you know, work around energy. And this is a big opportunity for Africa. So we saw the sort of evidence of this type of concept in the UK earlier this year in, in lockdown where electricity prices went negative. So people were paid to switch on and use electricity, which, you know, in, in traditional context of this inherently inflationary fossil fuel sort of uh, model, that would be unheard of. <clears throat> but in a renewable world where your feedstock is, is free, um, this is the reality of what we will see going forward, very disrupted markets. Unfortunately for Africa, really, uh, I think the last couple of years have been relatively stagnant. If not, you'll see some of the stats is a general decline. So things weren't looking good, I think, prior to COVID. In our publication last year called Fuel for Thought, we actually proposed that there was a, a turning point in the market and that the decade ahead was looking to be a much more positive from a, an investment, from a production um, and an export perspective, both for oil and gas. Um, I think the reality is that, um, as I've said earlier, the energy, the accelerated energy transition and the, and the sort of COVID demand disruption has really uh, sort of reversed that positive kind of gain. Um, and at best, we're seeing sort of a, a flat extension, a lot of sort of, ex, uh, sort of deferred investment, and probably a lot of actual investment won't even happen, um, let alone being deferred. And so, yeah, this really is exposing Africa's more specifically on oil. Uh, gas is, is in, a, in a much more positive uh, position going forward, which I'll touch on. So I think in a nutshell, you know, we see reserves have remained stagnant. Um, there's a bit of a, a, a split between offshore onshore, which is important to consider when we look at a tightening market going forward. Uh, offshore oil uh, production is going to be more expensive and come under more pressure. So we see countries such as Angola, where they need to recapitalize oil reserves, they're offshore, slightly more expensive, are going to be more exposed 
uh, in terms of risk of this uh, shifting energy transition. Um, the domestic market, I mean, the, the, the gas side is more resilient. Uh, gas still has, I think, kind of good legs. Uh, you know, it's forecast probably 2035. And that's largely because, you know, gas is still seen as a, a bridging fuel. It's probably a 60% lower emissions footprint, and it's sort of more versatile in the way it can be used. And certainly also there's a greater domestic demand for um, for, for gas uh, for power in Africa, which I think is again a, a positive um, opportunity for Africa. Um, just on the consumption side, we see that um, that split that I spoke about between developed and developing economies, um, Africa is going to definitely sit in the developing economy. We uh, have massive problems with energy poverty in Africa. Um, consumption will continue to grow, um, and, and I think that uh, what we'll see and what you see in the report is that actually that consumption, domestic consumption in Africa is being taken up by imports. And this is an opportunity where um, Africa producers actually need to try and look to pivot around kind of import substitution because the export market specifically in oil is going to decline quite quickly. Maybe just um, of kind of importance for us, I think back in, in SA, to touch on is the recent announcement announcements on, on LAYPAT, which is part of the sort of Block 11 offshore. Um, there was Brillpad and, and LAYPAT. So, you know, LAYPAT has just been announced last week. Um, these are sort of exciting uh, sort, of, sort of exploration announcements. A challenging um, discovery, I suppose, for South Africa. It is, you know, I think uh, Engineering News has covered this recently quite extensively. But, you know, roughly 175 kilometers offshore, four kilometers deep. And it's a condensate, which is, is quite a specific sort of niche uh, product. It's really only uh, the Petro SA uh, refinery in Mossel Bay that is geared to handle condensate because it was actually built originally off the, the inshore uh, gas field, which is exactly a very similar product. So a condensate, largely a, a wet gas. But you know, the Petro SA facility is really very, very small by in comparison to larger scale refineries um, at 46,000 barrels a day versus, say, a SAP ref at 180,000 uh, barrels and a global scale refinery at 380,000 barrels. So I think that the commerciality of being able to use those Brillpada Laypad fields, which is about a, a 1 billion um, equivalent, oil equivalent find to use that into into the south african domestic market is going to be challenging because we don't have refinery set up to do that and the one that we do have is is really quite small but nonetheless you know condensate i think has got a niche role and and probably you know would find a, a very valuable home and may have sort of more indirect benefits for south africa